Um, we now move on to the rest of our agenda where we'll actually be building on the things that we heard here. The framework that the council members um, have identified is what we will be talking about. The first was that to create lasting change, as, as Bill has said, uh, we need very high public awareness. And high public awareness, we hope, will lead to high public will. Uh, John Bridgen will be talking about some of the findings in that area. Next, we believe that we need to create a social sector that will work together and create the greatest amount of change. Paul Schmitz talks about needle moving change, not just counting an outcome of a, of a youth through a program, but needle moving change of opportunity in that community, opportunity for those youth. And so um, our, our uh, community collaborations group will be speaking to that. Next, we recognize that youth are the leaders. As Ellie said, not tomorrow's leaders, but today's leaders in this solution. So we'll be talking about empowering youth as leaders and Kristen Richmond, Jim Gibbons, and John Bon Jovi will be speaking to that, and we'll have a great discussion about that. Next, we recognize that education, the right education, the relevant education, the education that leads to work opportunity really matters. And so with the great assistance of Scott Cowan, who wasn't able to be here today due to a, a, a funeral service that, that he is actually helping lead today, um, we have his contributions and, and we'll be discussing um, observations on education that matters. And then last but far from least, that we all together need to work to spark employer action to create increased opportunity for these youth to recognize the assets of that these youth are to our communities, to our employers. So that's the way we'll spend the next uh, two hours and change in both presentation and discussion of, of that uh, framework for creating the enduring a national momentum on this important issue. Because as Bill says, uh, we've got two years. This is not a two-year problem. This is a national opportunity. And thankfully, Paul identifies that it's not because we're a leadership council, but because we are leaders and we're speaking to leaders and working with leaders who can take action, not just in this room, but um, in all of the rest of their roles. So we'll see what we can do about that. Um, so the request of each of the speakers was uh, that, that they would really, uh, building on what we discussed last time, uh, speak to their issue about what we now know and believe, what we recommend, and what actions we propose taking, and when possible, highlight for all of us exemplars that, uh, that they have seen that are uh, examples of how this work can be achieved. Um, without further ado, we'll move to John Bridgeland for his discussion about uh, public awareness. Thank you so much, uh, Patty. I must say I continue to be mesmerized by that last panel. Such a, an emotional experience. Um, I, I don't have a quote from Kanye West or <laughs> Kofi Annan, but <laughs> interestingly, I feel like the council has finally found its, its voice and its moment. And I, so I, in that spirit, would actually like to begin with a quote from um, Ellie Flores, who said, disconnected, <laughs> disconnected youth continue to be disconnected because solutions are disconnected from the real issues. Put yourselves in the shoes of young people. And so I feel, I know that's been sort of the first instinct of the council from the beginning, but uh, I was also completely taken by what Maurice and Bill and Paul said in terms of uh, the power of sharing stories. And frankly, Paul, I had never heard your personal story uh, of your own journey. Um, and uh, I, I think um, if the council could take this panel that we've just had and lift it up to the American people all across the country, that would go a long way in terms of a communication strategy. So in a spirit of great humility, um, I now um, uh, building on the wonderful work that Michael Kempner and, and John Bon Jovi and, and uh, Maurice and Bill and all of us around this table in terms of listening to young people around the country who were uh, having these experiences of dis uh, disconnectedness, um, I had had this experience on the high school dropout issue where there were two kind of seminal moments that vaulted that issue to the public stage in terms of creating public awareness and will and an appetite around the country to address it. And the, and the two 
key factors were one, lifting up the voices of young people and doing it in a, a national survey where we talked to dropouts all across the country. Um, and a second was um, holding up sort of the economic imperative of taking action. And so in that uh, spirit, uh, and, and Patty um, wanting some deliverables, uh, uh, we talked about uh, doing a national survey of what we call the promise and challenge of America's forgotten youth. Because both as Paul and Bill echoed, they really, uh, these young people who are leaders, who are assets, who are social entrepreneurs, are often forgotten, underutilized, uh, and need to be lifted up because they are true assets to our nation. In fact, the president in his state of the, his, his joint session to Congress talked about how this country needs and values the talents of every American. And that was in the context of talking about high school dropouts. So today, um, we wanted to have a discussion with the council to understand the perspectives of disconnected youth, um, to have a discussion of how we raise awareness of the challenge and opportunity that they present, and to encourage action that really ties into the needs of communities, sort of grounded in the reality of what uh, those three extraordinary young people talked about, but also in these tough fiscal times, and this environment also um, ties into and is relevant to the needs of the economy. So we did a, um, a national survey. These were uh, young people who are disconnected are actually difficult to locate in some circumstances. So we had to do these um, intercept interviews in 23 locations around uh, the country. They were performed in August. Um, our survey focused on 16 to 24 year olds currently out of school, out of work for at least six months, uh, no college degree. Some may have uh, had some college. Uh, didn't have a disability that prevented them from long-term employment, uh, not incarcerated, and also not a stay-at-home parent with a working spouse. <clears throat> Nationally, as Patty's talked about, um, this population, there have been more than a dozen studies that show that it ranges from about 1.4 million to more than 5 million uh, disconnected youth, depending on the period of time of disconnection, their income level, uh, level and, and age, whether they're incarcerated and their, their marital and, and parenting status. Um, really want to thank, um, there have been three institutions that have done a lot in this country on disconnected youth, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, the James Irvine Foundation uh, with Jim's leadership, and the Annie E. Casey Foundation. We've also worked really in close partnership with practitioners on the ground, the Forum for Youth Investment, Jobs for the Future and Youth Build. So uh, we all know poverty is both a cause and a consequence of youth disconnectedness. Um, but I wanted to highlight that while the risk of disconnection is highest among the poor, among those who come from low-income families and non-traditional households, it's not unique to them. It penetrates into the middle class, even into to upper classes, and certainly um, uh, into two-parent households. Uh, four in ten, and this reflects um, the national trends, four in ten of those who are disconnected uh, haven't graduated from high school. And the data actually shows that uh, those who go on to be disconnected um, at the ages of up to 23, actually most of them had some form of disconnection when they were teenagers. About, yeah. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, and if you have questions along the way, please just jump in or uh, insights, comments. About half uh, live uh, with their parents. You know, the panel talks so compellingly about the, the power of family, the power of relationship. And families really are the, the social lifeline um, for disconnected youth in America. And uh, they talk personally and compellingly about, you know, without their, their parents or other family members. Uh, it would be difficult uh, to find their way. Um, having said that, about four out of 10 uh, have moved two or more times in the last year. Um, so there's a, a big issue around a lack of uh, stable housing. And as we heard, I think from uh, Karima, you know, she, even she was couch hopping in her own life. <laughs> Uh, the long-term effects of disconnection are, you know, significant to individuals, to our society, to our country. Of course, they have uh, difficulty obtaining and maintaining employment. Uh, they will live in, most likely live in poverty if they remain disconnected. Uh, family, marital, relationship, instability. 
and research around hot high school dropouts tell us they're um, more likely to be unemployed, living in poverty, receiving public assistance in prison, on death row, unhealthy, and single parents with children uh, who drop out. But uh, so those are the challenges. Um, that's a bit of the despair. But um, I, I just have to tell you, in talking to these young people around the country, I know we saw this in the in the listening sessions. Despite their extraordinary challenges, they don't view themselves as disconnected. When you ask them, you say the government defines you know youth who are out of school and out of work as disconnected youth. They say that doesn't resonate with us. We've got families, we've got friends, we have social networks. Maybe they're not always the most powerful social networks in terms of getting employment or connecting to school. But these young people really view themselves not as problems to be solved, but as potential and promise to be fulfilled. 70, uh, 73%, notwithstanding most of them growing up in poverty, many of them having, you know, living in violent, crime-ridden neighborhoods, problems with substance abuse, often alone in the home. Uh, we'll talk a little bit this afternoon about uh, this remarkable data point of how many of the young people in the United States are heads of household at the ages of 17 to 22. It's, it, it blew me away. Uh, but 73% remain really optimistic about achieving their own goals and are, are very confident in doing so, uh, notwithstanding these struggles. Um, they, they all start, you know, they're, they're like other children. They start with high hopes. Um, uh, more than half saw themselves graduating from college. And remember, a lot of them are growing up in homes where the parents haven't even graduated from high school. And so notwithstanding maybe the lack of expectation, they themselves view themselves as leaders and successful and needing college to be successful. Boys, the boys we talked to talked about being, you know, lawyers, policemen, athletes, joining the military, the young girls who wanted to be nurses, teachers, lawyers, doctors, veterinarians. Um, and they saw the importance and relevance of education to fulfilling these goals. Uh, over time, so as they move beyond childhood, they continue to have, you know, such high hopes. And all the panelists talked about the, you know, the power of, of family um, and family life to them. A good, strong, stable family life is uh, sort of the leading hope that they have for their own lives. But then they quickly go on to talk about the importance of um, getting a good education, finishing high school and college, and, and having a uh, good career that um, has some relationship and connection to what their dreams are. A lot of them talked about the disconnection in school you know, between what they were learning and what they wanted to be in life. Um, sorry. I, uh, they also um, are uh, confident they can achieve their goals, uh, and they talk about uh, having support systems in life. So I think there's a lot from which we can build. Uh, they have goals to finish high school and college, believe they can achieve it. Uh, they know the job they want and feel they can get it. Um, there's a, a sense of, of, I know part of this is youthful optimism. Uh, but they, they view themselves as having potential and being leaders. This uh, was one of the most uh, startling and, and encouraging slides to me. When we asked them, um, and I think it was Ellie who talked about, uh, we need to own our own success. We need to turn our own dreams now into action. Um, that's what they want to do. They actually accept responsibility for their own futures. Uh, they don't. Uh, look at their difficult circumstances and say, you know, society's putting up a lot of roadblocks. It's their fault. It's the school's fault. It's the community's fault. It's my family's fault. It's my neighborhood's fault. They're talking about owning their own futures and taking responsibility for their own action. Um, when we uh, probe more deeply about uh, how they're spending their time, remember they're out of school and out of work. They have strong social networks. They're, most of them are wired and connected. Uh, through social media. Um, uh, when we probe more deeply on looking for work, uh, the vast majority are actually looking for work when we ask them that question directly. Uh, and many are trying to get back into school. Um, we wanted to understand uh, across this remarkable population what their obstacles were to reconnecting to school. And obviously cost and affordability of college uh, was the leading answer. But they also talked about um, uh, many of these young people are caregivers. You know, they're taking care not only of children, but they're taking care of their mothers or their grandmothers or someone who's sick in the home. But they also identified a lot of the practical barriers, transportation. Uh, Public Agenda did a great survey on college dropouts a few years ago, and it, the leading answer 
uh, from young people who were dropping out of college was that they couldn't balance um, uh, the need to work with their uh, school schedules. So the balance of, of work and school was a real challenge. They face obstacles reconnecting to work, obviously, uh, in this environment of high unemployment. Uh, one question is, where are the jobs? But they, they um, identify quickly they don't have enough of the life skills, the work skills, the, the experience um, to get uh, decent jobs and maintain those jobs and obviously see the connection between um, education and, and work. When we um, probed, uh, and we're coming to an end here, but when we probed, you know, what was the most helpful thing in your journey to reconnect? Um, if a new center were opened, um, like the center Bill has in the toughest crime-ridden area of Pittsburgh, in your community dedicating to help it, you know, helping others, uh, find, like you find jobs, go back to school, develop skills, um, who would you like to see in that center? And uh, the number one uh, response was successful peers, young people that they could relate to, that maybe shared their life circumstances, their life stories. And that's why I love that Bill and Maurice and Paul all told their life stories, because it gives you such a sense of hope. Um, so people like them, who are successful peers and can share their stories. But they also, as is, is I think uh, Ellie mentioned, a college professor, right? When we asked him about who was your mentor, college professors, um, obviously parents and family, but also encouragingly to Bobby and, and Byron's work, uh, business mentors or advocates for my own community. And they talked in sort of the open-ended responses about the power of those social networks and business leaders in connecting them uh, both to, to uh, work and to, and to education. Um, programs that address, when we asked them, so which uh, programs would provide the most um, support to you if it were available to you, what would be most attractive? And these earn and learn models that, you know, play the dual function of both connecting them to school and getting them a credential, but also, you know, immediately employ them. And I know, you know, Kristen, we've talked a lot about and a lot of the employment models that have been lifted up are these earn and, earn and learn models. Um, I'll also say that through this survey uh, flows, and I meant to highlight it, this um, uh, altruism. They're not just out for their own economic advancement. They want to help communities and they want to help other people, including other people in their circumstances. And so what I hear, you know, Robert, your extraordinary vision for the power of the corporation and the story of Karima of how national service literally transformed how she viewed herself and her own life and, and the kind of agent of change she could be to help others, uh, it just strikes me that seems to be such a beautiful and central tenet. To, so the idea uh, is to take um, the listening sessions and capture the stories and some of the powerful quotes, including Ellie's now, and then to marry it with what, every, what all the existing research tells us about disconnected youth, and then to have the national survey findings inform that um, and Colin and Alma Powell have agreed to do in sort of an open letter to the American people in this report and to uh, uh, try to help, you know, Michael, in your efforts to formulate a communication strategy, have it be one additional tool that can lift up the voices of young people and give, I think, give the nation a little more hope that um, uh, this is something that could be a tackle. So the mayor slipped me a little Chinese proverb and it was so perfect, I'm going to end on it since... <laughs> since Paula's got us in the spirit of, of quoting. And I just thought it was so great and so apt. Uh, go, to the, go to the people, learn from them, love them, start with what they know, build on what they have. But of the best leaders, when their task is accomplished, their work is done, the people will remark, we have done it ourselves. Not bad, Mayor. <laughs> So uh, that's the survey. Really interested. I mean, this, these, it's a bit of a blunt instrument. I know that. It's not as, always as powerful as the anecdotes and the stories. But would love, you know, the people who work every day, reactions, thoughts, ideas. Yeah. Bill. Um, one of the numbers that really jumped out at me was on page 13. Down at the bottom, it says, volunteering in my community, 3%. What that tells me is that there's lack, there's not an opportunity yeah. for these children, young people, to get involved. Yes. That that number correlates with everything that we've heard today. 
because you had a 80% coefficient of we want to help our community and a 3% opportunity, yeah. there's, there's the need right it, there. Exactly. And I want to highlight in the slide they continue to have high hopes. I meant to, Bill. I'm glad you, you did. So 70% um, make a difference in improving life for others. One of the highest response rate from these young people who were often born in, re right. in difficult circumstances and are working so hard to get a job and get an education. So really uplifting. Yeah, there's the evidence. I think the one-two punch of the, of the direct stories and, and voices we have heard with data from a very large cohort as Heart Research, from a reputable organization like Heart Research backed by America's Promise and Civic Enterprises is, is exactly the kind of authoritative voice from those voices that need to own the leadership, which is the, the youth themselves. And I, I look forward to talking in our workshop uh, portion about how we can combine these two assets into something that helps us all understand more. I want to use this. Um, you, as we go forward. Good. This needs to be I'm sorry. We use, need to use this, these two numbers. Interest in serving, lack of opportunity. That needs to be a headline yeah. in something. Yeah. Okay, just so we don't forget that. That's good. Okay. Other remarks? I also think, Bridge, the, the, the slide, slide number 12 that you pointed out about young people recognizing that it's their responsibility, I think that's also huge. And as we message this, uh, that we've always believed that these young people are an asset, and I think they confirmed it for us, that right. they're not asking for a handout here. They're just asking for an open door to walk through, but they're going to take care of the rest. Yeah. And I think we really need to respect that and amplify that. You know, one, one thing that I um, also wanted to highlight, and all the questions <laughs> direct me to do so, was um, in the list of the people they wanted to connect to, they weren't looking for a handout. And they actually, the what ranked lowest were uh, contacts with social workers, you know, government managers, people running programs. It sort of reinforces it's not you know, these <laughs> programs and institutions are critical, but ultimately it's about relationships. Kristen and then Michael. So I am just extremely heartened. John, thank you so much um, by the panel this morning and, and your research. I look at page 16 and the reference 79% of youth who want to have successful peers and young adults that they can relate to and how that relates to the work that we're trying to put together on the youth engagement uh, program is just, it's really mm -hmm. exciting validation of where we're focusing our, our energies and also a huge responsibility to be able to put something together that um, can deliver on that promise, uh, that desire. Thank you. Thank you. Michael. John, this is, uh, excuse me, congratulations. It's really terrific stuff. and I. Putting my communications hat on, I mean, I sort of have a 72 different stories that could come out of this, <laughs> um, including one overarching story or two. My question is, um, how can we publicly use this research? I mean, what are the constraints? Are there are there no constraints? Um, and I'm not saying we're doing it today, but you know, at some point, this research begins to get a little stale. So, so I love it, and there's so many good things in here. So even before we decided how we can use it, I mean, when we're going to use it, I want to understand how we can use it. Maybe that's better for you, Leslie, I don't know. Do you want to go to I just say we, we developed, this is a, a private effort that we developed for multiple purposes. And, but the overarching purpose was to uh, create more public awareness and eventually public will for um, stakeholders, policymakers, and the general public to, to understand um, this extraordinary group of young people who we think are basically forgotten in terms of um, public policy, in terms of um, deliberate, concerted efforts across the country. I know that's what we're all focused on here, but I can just tell you, you know, having surveyed them and then uh, looking at all the research Congress is just starting, you know, to discover this population in a way that I think presents an opportunity for the country to ignite real action. So, Leslie, sure. So, um, uh, Michael, there really aren't any 
limitations other than um, you know working with civic enterprises um, as the sort of owner of the research along with America's Promise. So um, you know I would rely on we we can highlight it and promote it and and really use that as a mechanism for taking the the message out there. Um, you know with the guidance of of Bridge and Civic Enterprises. And and just my personal view, it'll be interesting to talk about it more and as we go through work group ideas about how to utilize this. But what we saw today from that panel is that much as I love Paul and Bill and Maurice, there was no more effective spokesperson yeah. to tell this story than the youth who answered these questions. And um, we need to use people who really help us connect uh, to youth as assets, and those are often youth. So I think it'll be interesting to spend time really thinking about how do we reinforce what we believe, that leadership is an action, not a position, and use those leaders to help deliver it. What is your timeline? Uh, we're, you know, looking for an occasion to um, have broad public attention and awareness. So. And, and you don't think our webcast is that? <laughs> <laughs> so today we're announcing that. <laughs> but we're going to um, finish the report up by, you know, November, probably, or late October. Right now this is just this is the top line. Of the These are just, the, yeah, we have, there are 400 pages of cross-tab, and this, the data is really rich. So if you have any particular interest in any particular population, age, income, race, ethnicity, gender, um, place, you know, we have a lot of good data. And, a, and, and a, we hope a handful of key messages, as you're saying, Michael, that, that will resonate with, with turning us all into leaders on this, on this important topic. So, um, well, Would you just um, give some comments on, uh, on, on what the breakdown was of male, female, and also on uh, ethnicity? Yeah, the, the, it was representative of the population as a whole, 60% female. And the reason that uh, females are disproportionately represented is because they're um, often caregivers taking care of children. But then when you hold that constant, um, uh, the, it, it, males are slightly more represented. So that's how our survey unfolded. And then the, uh, we did have a slide, but just in the interest of time, we didn't show it. Um, race and ethnicity reflected the um, representative population as a whole. Wonderful. We could do that all day, right? But I think instead we'll go forward to talk about some of the important actors on the ground with our next section, Catalyzing the Social Sector to Create Needle-Moving Change. And I believe at this point I turn it over to Michelle Cholin. Oh, who turned <laughs> Which We're going to do a tech, tech team, yeah. Yeah. Michelle, your mic needs to go on. There we go. Paul. Oh, thank you. Uh, so uh, we're very excited to share the work that we've been doing. Um, I've had the great uh, pleasure and privilege of working with Michelle Jolin as co-chair, but we've had really an all-star team uh, with Norm Rice and John Bridge, Lynn Diana Aviv, Maurice Lynn Miller, and others who've involved, including the Bridge Band groups that's done, that's done uh, given me more things, research to look at than I ever could, uh, but really helped us get to this point. And so, if you remember, we, we, we had this conversation at our first meeting, uh, and we read this article on collective impact, and John uh, Kania came and spoke to us, uh, and I, I framed it, and I'll frame it the same way today for me in terms of how I understand it, which is that uh, a couple years ago, I woke up and the, the headline in the local newspaper in my city was that we had the worst third grade reading scores for African American kids in the country. And the first thing I thought about was the day before I'd gotten a solicitation from uh, one of the largest youth organizations in the city, it was talking about how many youth it reaches and all the outcomes it's achieving. And I thought of all the groups I knew, and I thought of the fact that when I started doing this work 17 years ago, probably half the groups in existence now were in existence then and the data was no better. Yet all of them were claiming success. And so I was struggling with the disconnect between all these individual programs claiming they're achieving these great results and why citywide we don't see a change in the overall data. And so as with uh, the article on collective impact, I was about how do we reverse engineer this? And instead of asking the question, how do we find a successful program and scale it up? How do we start with how do we change the data for an entire city and work back. 
And what we find when we work back is it's not finding one program and scaling it that, gets, that fills that gap. We have to find a system. We have to build a system, a collective, collaborative effort. And so rather than looking at pockets of success, which has been the traditional way philanthropy and government and others have done, is find one thing that works and that's going to work. But as I shared in my own story, it wasn't one thing that worked. It was a lot of different things. And they, were all not, and they weren't necessarily all knitted together, but without any one of those things, it wouldn't have worked. And I find that uh, we have to think in a different way about this work. And because we're the Council on Community Solutions, rather than finding pockets of success, I think we wanted to find where are communities where they solve the problem? Where have they moved the needle? And we define needle moving uh, in this case, because we had to come up with a definition, as an overall change in the metrics for a city of 10 points or more. Um, and so that's when we start to see there's a real change here. When the graduation rate goes from 50 to 60 percent, those are real numbers. Um, and so rather than looking at programs, we're looking at what stimulates a community to actually solve a problem. And it's our belief also that part of the reason why I think so many people in America lack hope is because they don't see the data change for their community overall. They don't see that things are getting better. But when they wake up to a headline that teen pregnancy in their city is down over 30 percent or the graduation rates are up 20 percent, that actually can inspire people to believe again in nonprofits and government and the ability of people to work together and solve problems. Um, and I just want to recognize within that is that we, we also recognize uh, as we shared in some of our stories earlier, and as Maurice has so eloquently written about and demonstrated in his work, it's often not just programs. When we say all hands on deck, it's both we need the programs and organizations, government and business people, but some of the most effective interventions are people helping each other. It comes from families. When we looked up at the data John just shared, the number two source they wanted to see were families and, uh, you know, families and friends. They wanted those young adults, those relevant relationships to their lives, and they wanted family. And then after that, they wanted the help from other people, the professors and everyone else. But that family was up there uh, very high up. And I think we sometimes forget uh, that to solve these problems, the people who live in the communities have to be producers of the solution. They're not just clients. They're not just people to give us <coughs> input. That their service to their neighbors and friends and family is as important. Um, as, as what organizations and programs can provide. Um, just a quick story that builds on something Bill said, which is a few years ago I had a young person on a panel uh, from D.C., a young African-American woman, and she was asked if she ever volunteered in a community, and she said no, and they said, why not? She said, I was too busy taking care of my sister's kids, and every weekend I, I spent time helping my church. If she was from outside that neighborhood, she would get a volunteer service award. But she's doing what she considers just being part of her community. And so we have to remember that there's all sorts of ways that community supports itself that we don't wreck that outsides and professionals don't diagnose as <laughs> professional support. But there's people surviving communities every day because they're helping each other and, and doing that work. And so when we think about solving problems, we have to think about how we knit programs and organizations and efforts together. But we also have to think about how do we also support a community where residents help their neighbors and family and friends and are able to do that. So with that, we identified about 100 collaboratives around the country that we looked at. And we spoke to about 50 practitioners. And we identified 12 uh, that were really making needle making, moving change, which was really exciting for us to see that this stuff actually works. And they're making a huge difference in these communities. And, and three examples that we put before you, and I think I have to push that is in Cincinnati, and we talked about this at the first meeting, uh, and that's the work that uh, John Kenney had written about. But the problem, you know, the problem at the beginning is that, they, is that Ohio is 42nd in the country in bachelor's degrees. And Cincinnati has some of the same problems urban districts across the country had. Dr uh, terribly low graduation rates, lots of problems along the way. The president of the University of Cincinnati working with an organization called Knowledge Works, the United Way, the Community Foundation, and others created Strive which is a collaborative of organizations that are organized in student success networks along every milestone in the path of a young person from cradle to career. And they work together uh, using data, using research, uh, and, and forming a common strategy for how to address issues at each area of that, of, of, of that roadmap. Uh, the result, as you see, is the graduation rates have shot up. 
college enrollment has gone up, uh, and they're finding uh, progress on all elements. Just a quick example of how this works. They have 14 mentoring programs in Cincinnati that are one of the student success networks. The deputy superintendent of schools comes to meet with them every month. And she identifies, here's the three schools where we're having the most truancy. And it's those 14 groups' job then to figure out how do we intervene at those three schools. So rather than competing with each other and just taking who comes through the door, they're being strategic. And they're working together to figure out how do we collectively solve this problem. Here's where the intervention's needed, so let's get in there right now and work there rather than what they probably all did in the past, which is each had their own clientele that they served, and it didn't really connect it to each other or to a larger strategy. And so that's what Strive has done. And they've had a shared vision. Uh, they have a network uh, with full-time staff facilitating all of these networks and bringing people together. They have a data analyst that's constantly mining data and put, making that, translating that data into actions that the organizations and networks can take. Uh, they have funders who formed a collective so that uh, the funders are supporting the groups to work together on these strategies, um, and they're basing everything on data and evidence. Um, one of the interesting stories there is that some of the larger organizations didn't feel they should have to share their data, uh, but now their data is as transparent as the grassroots groups, and it's changed the dynamic of how groups work together and who's seen as successful and who's not. So Cincinnati is a great example. Another great example is Memphis, uh, and Memphis. Uh, had, was number one in the country in violent crime in 2006. And the district attorney uh, organized Operation Safe Community that brought together law enforcement and other community groups. Uh, they had uh, over 800 residents participate in the planning process. So they're really listening to the community. And they formed uh, 15 teams around a 15-point strategy to help reduce crime, but recognizing crimes related to lots of other issues. So they formed 15 different groups. They have over 700 participants in those 15 teams from organizations, from community, from the faith community, from business. Um, and one thing they do is they make all the data of their work transparent. It's all on the website. And so they're aligned. Uh, they use research from the University of Memphis and the National Academy of Science and drew on models in New York and Florida. Uh, and they built an evidence-based model that they're all collectively working toward. Uh, they're aligned. They have full-time staff in three tiers that are dedicated to managing this process to keep everyone engaged, everyone focused on it. And they've reduced the, the crime rate by 27 percent. It's the lowest in 30 years. Um, and so they're showing, again, that's needle moving. Um, the third example, which we got a great update tomorrow, uh, yesterday that uh, doubles what's up here, uh, is in 2006, Milwaukee, where I live, had the high, one of the highest teen pregnancy rates in America. Um, they found also, as they researched it further, a lot of it is formed of sexual abuse of young girls. Uh, and uh, there's definitely uh, different uh, by demographics in terms of, of where it's happening. Uh, the United Way uh, of Milwaukee, the city health commissioner, uh, and the publisher of the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel formed a committee of leaders including grassroots organizations, large organizations, funders, uh, business people. And then they created four subcommittees made up of tons of all these providers. And what they've done is built a campaign to reduce teen pregnancy by 46% over five years. That's a real impact. Um, they announced yesterday, actually, the decline now is over 30% um, in the first uh, few years. Since 2006, but I think they started the initiative uh, after that. But it's over 30 percent. That translates to 220 girls last year, fewer who got pregnant than had been on average before. And they're on track to meet their goal, which would reduce, I think, by over 400 girls a year. Those are real numbers. And that's a real change in a community. And those are all families who, and, and young girls who, based on John's data, become disconnected. They become caregivers rather than people going to college and everything else. It becomes a big barrier for their own development. And so those are real numbers. They have a funding collaborative where funders have come together to create a collaborative fund to support this effort. They have a media campaign with a pro bono marketing firm that's done amazing ads that if you live in the city you see everywhere. A lot of them geared at men. Most of the ads are geared at men. And they had a great ad showing a pregnant uh, boys who were pregnant on bus stops. Uh, they had. Uh, a number of things about sexual abuse, I mean, and, and some of it pretty, pretty uh, uh, edgy stuff. 
but getting the point across and also doing education through all of the schools uh, and building programs for girls throughout the city to help build their esteem and everything else. Um, they have uh, full-time staff divided. They have five different staff of the United Way who coordinate the effort and one director of the whole project. They do constant mining of data to share uh, and, and, and adjust what they're doing. Uh, they have the, uh, uh, again, it's the data, the funding, the collaborative, the full-time support of the network. And so we see these, that these collaboratives actually are having needle moving. And I should mention that having lived there, I knew a bunch of the programs in there. And again, all of them for years have been claiming they were doing all this great work to help prevent it. But we had one of the worst in the country. They might put their efforts together and connect and collaborate, and it goes down 30% in a couple of years. Uh, and I have great confidence they'll get further. So that's what these efforts are really doing. It's about moving the needle for a whole city, giving people hope that we really can create a solution a community solution to these problems. And these are three great examples, and there's others in your material. And I'm going to turn to Michelle to talk about kind of the broader case of what we've learned and what we think the council needs to do to continue this work. Thanks, Paul. So um, as Paul described, this is working. And this is, I think, why our team is so excited about what we've been doing over the summer and what we learned over the summer, that there are communities in rural areas, in urban areas, with complicated problems that are pulling together and making a difference and making change this needle moving progress that Paul described. And so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how they did it now and sort of what we're, you know, it's not easy. It's difficult. These are complicated problems. And it's often messy and a lot of work to try and get this to happen, but it's working. And that's what we're so excited about, um, that it can be this incredibly powerful lever for change if it's done in the right way. Um, so um, in some of the instances that we looked at, um, the, the collaboration itself was inspired by a moment of great urgency, like Paul talked about when Milwaukee had the, um, the, uh, um, the worst teen pregnancy rate in the country or when Memphis had the highest violent crime rate in the country. Um, in other instances, it was inspired by community leaders recognizing that a serious problem needed to be addressed, like in, um, in Cincinnati with, the, um, with the, uh, the fact that the university presidents were recognizing that um, kids were just not ready for, for college. Um, so different things brought people together for different reasons. Um, the communities also recognized um, in each of these instances that the problems are complicated. There's no one program, there's no one intervention that's going to solve the problem, as Paul said. And so um, they knew that the only way to make progress was if all the actors were pulling together and pointing in the same direction. Um, so from our research and from our proof point examples, um, we considered how can we encourage more of these collaborations to happen? and what needs to be done to move um, more of these into the categories of proof points. So first we tried to identify or sort of frame what are the core principles, you know, what are the characteristics of these collaborations that are working, um, what are the characteristics of success, and what do they need to thrive. So first on the core principles. Um, what type of collaboration are we actually talking about? As Paul said, um, the, the collaborations that we looked at um, were those that are aspiring to needle, move cha needle moving change on a community-wide metric. So that was absolute change of 10% or more on a key metric. In many instances, the collaborations actually saw more than 10%, but we decided to have that as a floor just because it seemed like a pretty dramatic, um, you know, dram dramatic progress, and so we could get a better sense of the numbers of um, collaborations around the um, community. But for example, as Paul said in Milwaukee, with um, teen pregnancy, it was a 30% decline, um, but 10% but was our floor. Um, we also focused on uh, community-wide. Um, some of it, some of the communities we looked at, it's large neighborhoods, um, but not, we were, we were specifically not looking at um, outcomes for program participants or, or collaborations that were just focused on collab or pulling together outcomes. It was sort of community-wide metrics. So that was sort of the first criteria and sort of the threshold most important to us. Um, in addition to that, um, there was also, um, these collaborations all had a long-term investment in success. Um, we know change takes time. They know change takes time. Um, these collaborations were um, making multi-year commitments to act. It wasn't um, you know, a short-term effort. It was going to be pulling together for the long term. There was also um, cross-sector engagement governments, businesses, philanthropy, nonprofits, all involved. They use data, as Paul said, um, both to set the agenda, um, to make improvements in the work, and then also 
to actually know what's working and to invest more resources, to drive resources toward what's working. And then finally, and this is something that um, we thought was very important in our, in our, in our work, um, in our group, um, was that the community members were um, partners and producers of impact in the collaborations. Um, they were not just part of a focus group, they weren't just consulted, but they were actually, you know, part of the leadership, part of the design, part of the important, um, uh, part of putting the, the collaboration together for the long-term success. Um, this was also one of the areas that in, um, in doing our research and, and, and talking to the collaboratives, they clearly didn't feel like they necessarily had it right. So it's actually a place where we think more work can be done, more um, uh, resources can be spent, and more lessons can be learned about how to do that better. Um, so those are the core principles. Um, so, um, so what do these successful collaborations um, have in common? Um, first, uh, a shared vision and agenda. They all have, in some form or another, um, a written strategic plan, a roadmap of some kind that lays out a path for people. Where, how are they, gonna, where are they going and how are they going to get there? Um, it's like the roadmap that Paul described that, um, that Strive has. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good example of, of it. Um, and all of the members of the collaborative felt like they could, could see themselves on that roadmap somewhere. Um, a second um, sort of commonality is that there's all um, effective leadership and governance. Um, a strong leader is absolutely critical to getting people to the table and then coordinating the efforts. It was just absolutely critical in each of the cases. Um, and that leader needed to be a neutral and honest broker. Uh, in some cases, it was a united way, like in Milwaukee. Um, in some cases, it was business leaders or the Chamber of Commerce. Um, that happened in Nashville. Um, or community foundations, university presidents, like in Cincinnati. We also saw examples of where it was the mayor and that the collaboration lived through several changes in mayors. Um, superintendents and police chiefs were also key in many of the cities. So a third um, sort of uh, common characteristic is um, the deliberate alignment of resources, uh, programs and advocacy toward what works. Um, the strategy in all of the cases was grounded in best practices. It was grounded in data and it was grounded in a con consistent continuing sense of what's working and, and reflecting on what's working. Um, in some instances, the collaboratives um, actually filled gaps. They saw gaps of where um, certain needs weren't being met and they created things to fill those gaps. And, but in most cases, it was more aligning services. The programs were there, it's just they weren't pulling in the same direction, and that's what the role of the collaborative was, was to, to pull people in the same direction and head toward a particular goal. Um, a fourth characteristic is uh, the dedicated capacity and appropriate structure. Of all the collaboratives we looked at, they all had dedicated staff, um, ranging from one or two people to sometimes seven or more, depending on the scope or issues and size of the community. But it was clear this couldn't be done by somebody whose full-time job was something else. This was something that we needed uh, dedicated <coughs> staff for. And fifth and finally was sufficient resources. Always back to that, that there needed to be resources um, for the staff, for the infrastructure. Not a lot of resources. These were not necessarily expensive um, operations, but um, you clearly needed resources uh, dedicated to this uh, uh, exclusively. So those are the characteristics of success. Now, looking at what the collaborations um, needed to thrive, and this came um, directly from the collaboratives that we talked to in our focus groups, in our um, consultations, they specifically told us there were a couple of key things that they needed. One is knowledge. They needed to know more information about what was working elsewhere. Many of the people that we met with, especially in these groups, hadn't met with each other before, didn't know what was going on in other places, and so, the opportunity for them to learn from others um, that were succeeding and trying different approaches and collaborative approaches was, was very appealing and they, they absolutely um, were, were looking for more of that opportunity to be together but also knowledge about what's working. Uh, they needed tools. Uh, they needed uh, support and sort of guidance and how to get started to understand um, what, you know, in some instances they pointed to the fact that when they were first getting started they didn't sort of know all the pieces to put together and so a tool like that to help get them up the learning curve would have been extremely helpful. So they helped us identify some of the gaps that they saw in, in um, 
when they were starting and, and what we could do to help or what, the, what certain tools could do to help um, advance other collaboratives. They identified technical assistance, um, again, both from peers and experts as another, um, as another important need and something that would help them advance their work. Uh, they talked about in a, in a, the policy environment and needing a more favorable policy climate to operate in, both at the, fed, at the federal level, but also very much at the state and local level, and again, funding. They talked about funding and the need for resources. Not a lot of resources, but resources, again, dedicated to the infrastructure and, um, and technical assistance. Um, so finally, as a group, um, uh, where, where are we? I don't, know who's, I don't know who's controlling this at this point. Anyway, um, so uh, as a group, building on the feedback we got from, I don't even know who's, okay. Um, so um, building on the, the feedback we got from the collaboratives, there, oh, yeah, back. I'm sorry, one back then, who's ever controlling it? Um, building on the feedback that we got from the collaboratives, the input, the recommendations, um, you know, our research, our interviews, the site visits, um, and what the most successful collaboratives have learned. Um, we believe the White House Council can play, you know, several different roles in helping encourage um, the use of this tool, the use of this lever, the use of this mechanism to, to, to help um, drive change and encourage more um, collaboratives um, by doing a couple of things. We think that um, providing greater recognition is going to be really important. That was something that, that all of them said would be important is to sort of highlight what they're doing to inspire um, others in their community to support it, but then also to inspire other communities to do uh, what has been done elsewhere. So recognition um, and sort of raising the profile of this was clearly an important, um, important um, thing that they think would be helpful and that we think we can probably do as, as White House Council. Um, they, uh, we, the White House Council um, uh, can help inspire more of these collaboratives by encouraging more funding, um, again, for infrastructure and technical assistance. We can inspire more of these collaboratives by uh, conducting dialogues and convenings with um, community leaders that may be on the verge of doing something like this um, to help encourage them, inspire them, help think about ways uh, to begin these collaboratives based on experiences and the things that we've learned um, from others in the community, um, others around the country who have, who have done this and done it successfully. And then we can um, help encourage more of these by recommending supportive policies uh, at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level. And um, we also can help encourage more of these by, um, by distributing the tools um, that we developed over the summer. Uh, we spent a good deal of time uh, with the BridgeSpan group putting together a set of tools, uh, both an inventory of what currently exists and then a set of new tools to, to fill in the gaps of what's not existing. Um, and we've gotten a lot of feedback of them, but from, about them from uh, existing collaboratives about how they could be helpful, how they could be useful. And we believe by um, helping to be able to distribute those widely and share those widely, they could um, help inspire uh, more collaboratives, more activity like this around the country. Yeah. I would just add that one of the cool things about these is that in almost every case, it wasn't about a dramatic increase of resources. It was about smarter use of existing resources. And the new resources were really spent on the process and the collaboration and the management of the collaborative. It's that backbone support and administration, as she said. It's, uh, and so in many cases, and there was some new funding. But I think in this environment, it's a way to try and increase impact by using resources in a smarter way. Absolutely. Question? We have time for questions of, of, of just clarification. And then uh, I want to make sure that we put a couple of recommendations on, on the table and make sure that uh, we've added those to our list. Any, any clarification or questions? There's an enormous amount of, of work that's gone into, into learning from the collaborators that are out there and beginning to fill the gaps with tools. And we need to acknowledge the contribution of, of Bridgespan to this work. Um, this has been a fantastic uh, White House Council effort, but it, it couldn't have gotten here without the, um, the great knowledge we got from the collaborations that are out there and the great work um, from, a, from a powerful team at, at Bridgespan. Um, let me. Yep. Oh, I just, I, I was just for, um, I was wondering, uh, uh, I was wondering if there's, um, 
Uh, any more thoughts on the on the role uh, of uh, employers uh, in this, just as we think about the, the employer partnership work? Yeah, I think in looking at um, the collaborations that have worked and you know made made a difference, and I've seen this 10% change. The role of employers differs, um, and so I think we need to f um, look more closely at those examples that have engaged employers. Um, like I said, the example in Nashville was led by the Chamber of Commerce and by 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 business. In other areas, it's not a, they're not they're just not as involved. Um, it just it just varies, and so I think if we um, you know spend a little time with those examples that um, have you know. Know, engaged employers effectively have been led by employers. Uh, I think we'll learn a lot, um, and uh, you know, that's exactly I think the next step we'd like to take is figure out how to connect that, given our focus on disconnected youth and the importance employers will play in that, and the good work that you all have done um, with your toolkit figuring out how to connect those. And I think if, if employers could tap into a network of efforts versus working with individual organizations, I think they could have greater support for the people they're bringing in. Because we know that when young people make that transition to the workforce, there's often a lot of barriers they face. And I think having a collective impact effort that they're attached to means there's more sources of support for those people uh, that are connected to each other. And I think employers should be part of those efforts and think of using those kinds of efforts as a way to advance their young people. Bill. One of the things that struck me in your presentation was, miraculously, these communities have figured out how to avoid the bureaucracy that tends to accompany these kinds of things. These seem to be very lean, focused, efficient, and has been sustained over a period of time. I would be very curious in your analysis as to how they were able to do that. that that's not by accident. And it may, it's not probably the proper time to get into it now, but. I'm very impressed with these examples because they could be used as illustrations to people that you don't have to be cumbersome in order to affect public policy, mm -hmm. but there are actually ways to get your arms around this stuff. Absolutely. And then structures to, to of the collaboratives vary widely. Some are very informal and very kind of, you know, um, uh, just um, based on trust and, and relationships. Um, some are slightly more formal, but none of them have become a big bureaucracy. And one of the things that in, in a lot of the, um, in the cases and in the research that um, was so important was that the collaborative never tried, usually did not try to be taking credit for the, for the I mean, they sort of increasingly put, or pretty consistently put forward those who were actually doing the work and those who were part of this as um, having the impact. Um, and so they never themselves became, you know, sort of the, the central, you know, story. It was the moving the needle that was the important goal. Uh, Maurice and then Paula, and we're probably going to have to put the questions on the table and not be able mm -hmm. to delve mm -hmm. too far into these answers because mm -hmm. there's just an enormous amount of information here. Maurice? Uh, yeah, we may not be able to get into a lot of detail. I know that we had taught, this is primarily around um, organizational organizational collaboratives. And then we had also talked about more like resident-led collaboratives, of which uh, it would be more the cultural groups, uh, settlement houses, the Mardi Gras Indians, and the Social Aid and Pleasure Clubs in New Orleans, for instance, uh, the Europe Tribe, those types of things, which uh, again, I think, take collaboration. It takes community. Uh, and I know that we've spent some time looking at that. Um, how does that kind of fit into, because uh, I know this is primarily around the organizational piece, how does the resident-led piece come into it? I'm I just think putting that on the table. Yeah. Well, two sentences and then we'll I would say it's a both and, right? I mean, I think that, again, we see that all hands on deck has to include residents uh, as, as leaders. And I think that those efforts, whether led by residents or organizations, the question is, is it focused on moving a needle? And I think we can, we're interested in all forms of collaboration and, and see lots of good wild, but we're really interested in this case and what moves the needle. And if it's resident-led or organization-led, I think that uh, if it's moving a needle, then that's really what, what, what we're interested here. Paula? And I'll, I'll raise the question we can, we can park and, and discuss later, which is in, in these collaboratives, what is, what is the mechanism for individual citizen participation? <clears throat> two sentences on that, which is, I think, as I said, um, most of the collaborations acknowledge that they haven't gotten that right yet, mm -hmm. and that it's something that I think we um, could actually help advance by doing, you know, making recommendations, doing um, more research, doing more listening about it, and thinking about a potential way to help these uh, collaboratives be able to engage, um, you know, citizens, residents, families more directly and completely. I think that's all part of what their goal is, but they've not, none of them would say they got it right at all.
And then Diana and Norm are both part of this work group, so I want to let them have uh, um, quick remarks. Um, Paul, I wonder if you could talk to the, you made the point uh, when you made your opening uh, comments about the fact that in your city, which is true probably in every other city in the country, that there are lots of organizations that will spend an awful lot of time describing the success of their efforts. But when you look at it from, um, from a view from the treetops, uh, that it hasn't moved the needle in that community. Uh, as you looked at these particular initiatives, and as we looked at other initiatives as well, where did the impetus come from to move from the particular to the broader view? To what extent does that need to be inside the groups already working there? To what extent outside? Or is there no story or pattern in that regard? I think it was some leader leaders finally getting up on the treetops and, and looking down and saying, we've got to do this differently. And I think, as, as Michelle said, it was often borne by a you know, that city finding itself really behind and really having a big challenge and saying, you know, we've been doing the same thing. You know, what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over, to get, expecting different results. We got to approach it in a new way. And the funny thing is, there is no network of these groups. That's what really we brought these groups together really for the first time. They all kind of organically happened because someone finally on the treetop and looked down, rather than looking from the program up. And Norm? I was just going to mention there was the question about policies. Uh, one of the things with the collaborative is the collaborative has got to also develop policies for engagement, uh, not only just for program delivery, but of, of reaching out and getting that, that kind of synergy uh, together. The results lend itself for that, but there's got to be at least a recognition that that cost, that's a cost that has to be uh, a part of the collaborative's uh, mission. I, I would also emphasize as somebody who participated in a couple of collaboratives that worked and a couple of collaboratives that didn't work but led us to new approaches that did work that those who had success also had their share of failures along the way and that data driven know what needle you're trying to move. In one example, a very good collaborative came together and created far more transitional housing to serve um, uh, uh, a ch what they thought would be a change in, in uh, um, uh, a dramatic needle moving change in homelessness. In fact, at the end of a very significant build out of transitional housing, homelessness in that community was higher than it had been when they started. So you ha that, that commitment to data and the commitment uh, uh, to continuing to hold people at the table for collaboration allowed that group to realize there had to be some other elements at play. And I think we heard that from a lot of the collaboratives that um, they didn't, doing it, setting up that way didn't automatically lead to immediate success. It led to holding each other accountable until they found the path for success. And, and sublimating an organizational ego to an interest, to the common interest, because we have an example that's in your books of a coalition that came together, had a needle moving change, and then they all started claiming credit and trying to raise money around their portion of it and then it fell apart and the results went back down. And so I think we have to be, I think some of those examples also demonstrate why this issue of really this new kind of collaboration where you really have to sublimate your individual interests to the common interest and to the common goal and the shared agenda and everything else is so important because the moment it becomes about each organization's interest, it falls apart. Now let me do just a little bit of, of, uh, uh, of important uh, record keeping here. If you remember, one of the uh, efforts of this council is to make recommendations in a public forum uh, before those, pre those recommendations go forward to the president. So I want to make sure that for the last two sessions, I've captured a couple of critical recommendations that did not appear in our interim recommendations. You'll remember that we have put forth a group of recommendations that the White House has accepted. The first one relates to John Bridgeland's uh, presentation, and that is um, a recommendation that the administration use the data and information uh, from both this uh, survey as well as the um, upcoming uh, additional work on Business Case USA to build awareness of the voice of youth and the economic imperative to act on this persistent issue and build support for programs and initiatives that address the opportunity for these youth. That's a, a fair uh, statement of your aspirations on that recommendation. The Council also recommends that the administration use existing venues 
such as Champions of Change, but also other venues, to highlight effective organizations and networks uh, that can be illustrations of what can work. Also, the Council recommends that this knowledge and tools that we've been talking about in this current presentation uh, are by the, that the corporation takes those, the Corporation for National and Community Service makes these tools available through existing open source venues such as serve.gov and the National Service Resource Center as Robert mentioned earlier today they were prepared to do. In addition, the Council recommends that the Corporation for National <coughs> Community Service provide these resources to other federal initiatives such as Promised Neighborhoods including working to make them available to those networks and other networks outside the government. The Council also recommends that the administration call on philanthropy and the private sector and employers to incentivize and participate in these needle-moving community collaboratives and encourage these kinds of public-private partnerships that bring in cross-sector data-driven community collaboration to address key challenges in their communities. Again, we talked a lot about the role of philanthropy, but if if funders disincent this kind of collaboration, it can be one of the reasons it's hard to hold a group to the table. So very important recommendations. Does that capture some of what we were trying to do here? Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, you've noticed that we're not taking bathroom breaks here, so I would encourage people to, to do as they wish or as they need, perhaps, perhaps not uh, completely as you wish, but we will move on. <laughs> we will, you might wish that we would take a break, but we're not going to do that. So we'll move on to the next important conversation that actually started with our panel, empowering youth as leaders, and I'll turn to Kristen Richmond to, to, to take us from there. Thanks, Patty. Um, in the spirit of keeping the youth voice first, I'm actually going to turn it over to John Bon Jovi, um, who's going to really set the, uh, the foundation for our theory of change and recommendations based on the voices of the youth that we heard in our, les our listening sessions. Thank you, Kristen. Um, various members of the council participated in youth listening sessions um, in New Orleans, Atlanta, Houston, and finally on June 6th in Newark, New Jersey, Michael Kempner, Bill Strickland, and myself met with um, a very engaged mayor, Cory Booker, a motivated staff, and a, a very eager clientele. Um, we partook in these listening sessions to go to the source, because what we're trying to do while we're engaging youth, as our panelists described earlier, uh, they see through the smoke, they know what's effective, and, and I believe that they know what's efficient. So what actually happens when people come together to listen? Well, from listening comes learning, and from learning comes opportunity and hopefully solutions. We met at a place called the YES Center, which is a collaborative with the Rutgers University that support at-risk and disconnected youth. Um, organizations such as Newark Now, which is a college placement program, uh, Help USA, which deals with housing and supportive services, La Casa de Don Pedro, which is a uh, specializing in Latino-specific social services, uh, Newark Works, which is the re-entry of the workforce when English is, in fact, your second language. We took a tour of their facility. Um, we then sat with approximately 15 kids, and I, I think we've come to the realization that 15 or 500, um, the same information came from groups of 15. But we were eager to find out how the kids would identify these support organizations um, to understand the kind of support that they were seeking, what their aspirations are and what their obstacles had been, and then to see how we could in fact help. Because we realized that communication was the key to success. Um, branding what we do as well as what these various centers, uh, regardless of the city that we were visiting, uh, is very, very important. I can't underline that enough. We need as a council to get the word out because there are participants in each and every community, and I've realized this in our own foundation's work. People want to be helpful. Sometimes they just don't know who or how to help. And so with a very clear messaging, uh, our council could better serve the underserved um, with something that is engaging. 
um, because there are a lot of part people who want to be a part of community may not have disenfranchised youth in their lives doesn't mean that they don't want to engage with them and uh, and the and the same is for these kids you know, we talk about education and uh, job opportunity. I'll give you a case in point. We're in the midst of opening a community restaurant in New Jersey right now, my wife and I and our foundation. And when you can um, empower the youth to not only volunteer, which they are, in droves, which keeps our costs down, but there aren't any prices on our menus, so these disengaged youth who don't have jobs and are volunteering and are gaining um, a, a confidence because that voucher system that they have qualified for by working for an hour um, has led them the, the opportunity to feed their family. And this isn't a soup kitchen. It's with beautiful silver and presented as any fine cafe here in the DC area. Um, the point is, is that it doesn't always take money. It takes a thoughtful community to find a solution. So we're realizing, talking to those kids back, going back to Newark, that they want those kinds of opportunities and they're willing to work for them. They don't want a handout, they want a handout. Wonderful. Well, um, while you gave great credit to uh, all of the people who participated in these sessions, I want to, oh. You gave great credit to everybody who participated in these sessions. I want to also make sure that we acknowledge that the fact that you came to listen, uh, that you were so clear about uh, the youth as assets, was enormously important to the youth and to the government leaders and the others we saw reach into their own leadership uh, in, the, in the days and weeks after that. So that was very important for everyone. Kristen, you want to keep, keep on this sure. theme? Sure. Thank you, John. Great, so I think that sets us up well to walk through our um, theory of change and then move to our recommendations at this point um, from the youth engagement group. So what do we believe? We believe that all youth are capable of creating solutions for themselves and others and their communities. Yet what youth need is access to information and networks that they can trust understand and put to use. And I know, John, yesterday when we were speaking, one of the, the big takeaways from these listening sessions are there are resources right in your backyard that folks don't know about. So how do we connect them with those resources? Um, and even, even better, make it a two-way street uh, to where they're informing those resources. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. We believe youth can be empowered as leaders if provided access to more supportive resources at their fingertips. And these resources include information about the services and resources they need and want, connections with people who care about them. So I feel like if there's one great message that came through um, this morning on our panel and has continued to come through, it's the power of that connection and the power of um, being inspired and relating to folks who've been through very similar circumstances. Nothing compares to the value of a caring adult. We've also, um, our theory of change also um, incorporates connecting youth to opportunities to support each other and engage with their communities. Youth are each other's best advocates and best support system. We must convene ways for youth to identify and access jobs and education together and then connect with their community leaders to highlight what is working for them. So in that spirit, I'll, I'll walk through what we feel should be done. Through this theory of change, the councils realize that we first must equip youth and then engage youth in these community solutions. So our recommendations um, start with information via a wiki encyclopedia of youth resources and services. Youth and their household express a lack of knowledge about community resources and a desire to share what works with them, with their, what works for them with their peers. And of course, gaining knowledge and sharing these days often means online platforms. One of the um, great statistics I think we saw from Bridges' presentation um, was that 46% of disconnected youth indicated that using the internet was one of the top three things that they spend their time doing each day. So we know that this is a real medium and it's a real method of access, so how do we highlight that um, in the solutions that we're putting together? Connections to caring adults and peers, businesses and organizations by promoting positive role models and mentors. 
In listening sessions across the country, youth participants identified caring adults as the most important contributor to their ongoing success. They also expressed the need and the desire to be inspired by people like them who are leading productive lives and making a difference in their community, despite having faced numerous personal challenges along the way. In every session, young people gave credit to those who provided them support um, when they needed it most. So then the third, the third piece of our theory of change is connecting youth to opportunities for support and engagement through national and regional summits. Um, I wanna quote Ellie. I thought he had a wonderful, um, wonderful quote this morning when he said, if we're not at the table, we can't have a dialogue. Right? So how do we bring these youth to the table? So let's unpack this a little bit um, in our recommendations. I'm gonna walk you through each, uh, <laughs> each recommendation um, at a high level. Um, so this is, this is the first one that I'll walk you through, the online resource. Our vision is that the tech experts of the world along with organizations and future users will leverage the communication networks of public organizations, youth serving national intermediaries and grassroots groups to fir first gather all of their information and then engage and activate youth to highlight and disseminate information via an online wiki encyclopedia. There are four key elements to this recommendation. Um, one, and you can see this detailed on the bottom, the local search element by category and by locality. Two, the profile component, most important for youth serving organizations to own and accept responsibility for their profiles so that they can keep them current and relevant. This also solves the problem of having outdated information out there. Um, youth can also, also create accounts that track and share their favorite programs. Three is user-generated content for this recommendation, allowing for youth and their advocates to rate and review specific resources. And then the fourth component is web and mobile access, and we've discussed this before. While most, most youth are savvy in using mobile technology to access information that links them to supportive resources, the same technology should be linked to web-based resources that make their experience seamless and, and super accessible. Um, so youth, their households, youth serving organizations and other stakeholders would use this resource to identify and rate effective resources and services in their communities. National intermediaries and public entities like One Stops would engage youth, parents, guardians, household members, teachers, coaches, probation officers, mentors, and others to use and improve this 24 seven virtual one stop shop. And we're excited about, about recommending this kind of a resource for youth to help them access um, resources at their fingertip in a, uh, a medium that they're using each and every day. We also believe a virtual resource like this um, amplifies youth voice while increasing program accountability. So businesses striving to earn positive reviews on Yelp, for instance, cre credibility via real-time peer uh, endorsements and access through a readily available and constantly updated database to which youth can contribute. So that's, that's the first piece of this recommendation. The second piece, which we've talked a bit about um, and just continue to be more excited about by the minute this morning is the role models and mentor section. <laughs> um, we have a vision of catalyzing a role model for youth campaign um, that through social media and face-to-face -face venues highlights local heroes across the, the country, shares their stories, and ultimately inspires young people and illustrates that it is possible for them to beat the odds. Um, this campaign would not only brand a new program, Rather, it seeks to leverage and amplify existing, exist, existing efforts going on um, around the country that are successful in linking youth with caring adults. Through this, through this work, the campaign will highlight these effective youth mentoring and related guidance efforts across the country that already support and inspire youth in search of opportunities. So then the third part of the recommendation is the National and Regional Summit. We also know that youth should be actively engaged as problem solvers. And so when community equips youth with resources, 
like the Wiki Encyclopedia, amplifies their voice and value and role models to help guide their empowerment, youth can take action. So we want to showcase this. We want to provide youth with the opportunity to leverage the knowledge gained from these resource, resource, resources and role models. We recommend face-to-face -face convening opportunities in which they can engage with their community, including government officials, national intermediaries, and grassroots organizations that have a strong demonstrated track record, business leaders committed to engaging youth in career opportunities, and community leaders and inspiring role models focused on aligning available resources to support youth as leaders. Through the national and regional summits, we feel that representatives from all sectors will work to create community solutions that build awareness of youth needs, amplify youth voice and value, spotlight solutions that work, empower communities with effective practices, resources, and tools, and challenge all sectors to align efforts that connect youth to the opportunities they need. Um, we, feel that the, we feel that the National Summit is a place to start, a call to action, and then that will lead into local regional summits, which will provide specific focus on local needs and opportunities, which we know is so critical, and leverage the amplification of networks of public organizations and grassroots groups to engage youth and activate all sectors in the challenge. So these are, um, walk you through our theory of change as well as our three recommended paths at this point. Um, we're excited to answer questions, take feedback, um, and uh, keep putting this together. Yes. Hi, John. Just to clarify, were you suggesting that these online resources live on their own or that you fold into existing US, USG resources like what Robert talked about this morning? I think preferably that we fold into existing resources. Um, we are right now, we've spent time um, building the roadmap for these recommendations and now we're figuring out how they can, how they can live and breathe um, most effectively and hopefully within existing <coughs> resources. Make sense? Yep. yep. Michael? I'd actually have a contrarian view. The, um, if it's yeah. going to be a real wiki that's going to have credibility yeah. among the youth that we want to influence, it has to yeah. be a lot of self-generated content and it can't live by the rules of a USG website. I don't think it'll be successful. Mm -hmm. Plus, anything that says USG on it, well, you know, it's like we heard about social workers, will not have the same credibility and grassroots to the local community. So I would highly recommend that we allow something that we catalyze it, but as in any wiki, it, it lives on its own after that. By say, it doesn't cost any money; it's self-generated. So, um, content that would be my thought and recommendation. Other thoughts on that before we? Yeah. Yeah. We are there it? ways to build on other things like IMAP America and other things that are out there already, yeah. versus kind of creating a new thing? Especially as we learn from all, bringing into government would be, we know from trying to create a volunteer generation inside government, like it's a very hard thing to do. Versus working with existing resources out there. Let's go around and continue to get some questions, and then we'll let you let, we'll let you answer it as a batch here. Bill? One of the things that really struck me in Newark was um, <coughs> the absolute uh, admiration these young people have for John. Mm -hmm. I, I had two experiences I think are very important. Uh, when he came to Pittsburgh, we hung out on Saturday afternoon, and he invited me to his concert. And I saw 18,000 young people stand up to celebrate not just your music, they celebrated you. Because I looked at that video presentation you had behind the stage and images of Nelson Mandela and some pretty extraordinary people were incorporated into your concert. And I thought to myself, here is a great vehicle to promote youth engagement. You get guys like John Bon Jovi incorporating that into their life. It, I'm telling you, it is, it is very powerful. And there are many people like him that if we could get these folks engaged and organized as resources to promote this thing, it'll do a whole lot more than any internet opportunity. Believe me, I, I saw it was a phenomenon. And it was not just the music, it was the fact that these young people were willing to buy into what he was talking about because of their admiration for him. And then I saw it at, in our session, Michael, when we were together, 
that these 15 kids, they never took their eyes off the guy. And I thought, this is a call to resource, man. We need to take advantage of this. This is what I call a marketing opportunity. <laughs> I think, Bill, that... Oh, go ahead. <laughs> it's okay, you give him a little love here. A little love. Right. Uh, Mayor? Norm? Norm, sorry, Norm. I'm a recovering. I, 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 call, I call him Mayor, too. I call him Mayor, too. I'm, I'm taking the 12 steps. Uh, one, one source, uh, just uh, uh, keeping the back of your mind. A lot of the community foundations and foundations that have uh, a large database, uh, especially for those who go online and contribute, that they can be a source for, for ta uh, uh, getting involved in. Uh, other organizations, donors choose. There's a network that's slowly growing where that data uh, uh, is available, and it would be really good to, to put that in place. I know as soon as you said it, I, I thought about our organization because uh, Minneapolis, Give Big, a lot of people are starting to get philanthropy invo uh, involved in engaging. This would be a good place to put it. Um, we're not going to be able to go as far as we want, but I think, Kristen, it might be worthwhile for you to <coughs> respond to um, this issue of, of third party USG or some blend of the, of the two, which may be the, the long term answer. We heard from the Department of Labor, for instance, that they had been building a, a resource of of some of these things. Well, it's really interesting that you all mentioned IMAP, IMAP America and Donors Choose, because those are two organizations that we've reached out to and tried to gather as much diligence as we could around how this could be an overlay on an existing platform, how we could utilize what they're already doing. But I, I definitely want to um, pay close attention to, to Michael's comment as well, and that we really want this to, um, again, we're recommending, um, but we want it to uh, provide a unique resource, or we're recommending that it provide a, a, new, a unique resource that's not out there, and we don't want that to be compromised in the process. So I think it's fair to say we are, um, th this is our, we've really focused on the recommendation and the roadmap for um, how it should look, and now how we bring that into our, where it lives and breathes and how it's executed is, the next step. So if, if I could, if I can play chair for a minute, I yeah. think that what you're recommending is that the administration uh, call on both U.S. government parties and third parties to consider yeah. ways to create a virtual encyclopedia of locally accessible, youth-identified, youth-rated electronic yeah. resources that connect them and their households yep. to the information they need. Great summary. So. Um, um, obviously lots of work to be done to figure out who and how. Um, Can I suggest in what, the word electronic, yeah. digital? Okay, yeah, yeah. good, I'm showing my age. <laughs> <laughs> it's again your kind of rock star <laughs> ability to identify <laughs> it's digital, not electronic. Um, a second recommendation that came out of your group, I believe, is that the council recommends that working with the Corporation for National and Community Service uh, there be a broad call to all sectors and collaborators to leverage, amplify, and expand the uh, support systems and influencers to inspire young people in search of opportunity, including on efforts like the summits that have been described, right? So that, that, that we work together, again, uh, based on Robert's um, commitment around that effort. Good. Um, that's correct, and we had a, a great meeting uh, with your team yesterday to just make sure we, we gathered all information about the, uh, the activities that are currently occurring as well as the, the summit in uh, January dedicated to mentoring and make sure that we're, again, amplifying and, and complementing those efforts with our recommendation. I would just say, again, I know it seems obvious based on that powerful panel, but um, the people who are going to be best at doing some of this work are the, the youth themselves. Um, that is what the, quote, user-generated content would, uh, would be for such an encyclopedia, for such an effort. And the role modeling and role mentoring um, effort is one that um, yeah. you've got much work ahead, but we heard again how important that was to expand that. So we already uh, submitted a recommendation on that, so I, I don't need to repeat that. Uh, Diana? Yeah. Just a quick one. Um, summits are great for gathering people together and pulling together suggestions and ideas. Um, they have their limitations in that 
when people disperse from the, get those gatherings, if there isn't a way for them to move forward, sometimes the great energy and excitement that happens at the summit dissipates over <coughs> time as people go back into their lives. What thoughts have you given to how you take what happens at those summits and moves it forward to ongoing sustained activity where the summit is just a step along the way rather than the end result? I think Jim looks like he wants to answer that one. Yeah. Yeah. Let me uh, just uh, I'll be very brief and we're going to discuss this a little bit this afternoon but the way that our recommendation uh, really is designed is a national type summit uh, that then serves as a catalyst. So imagine the folks that would come to that would be part of the movement out to communities to engage local and regional summits to carry it forth. So I, I think that you're right that if, if it's a one-time shot, it could fizzle and the vision uh, is really one of ongoing engagement and dialogue. I'm going to request a little bit of an agenda um, shift here. We have uh, 40 more minutes of our public uh, meeting, our important public meeting, and we have two presentations. So I'm going to suggest, because Scott Cowan was the creator uh, and the uh, thought leader behind the education that matters, that we very briefly ask Jim to recap and that we hold the deeper discussion on this very important part of our message on education that matters for when Scott and Mark Guerin and others can join us at the, at the next meeting. So Jim, if you would give a recap of the education that matters uh, element of this important topic. All right, first, so yeah, thanks. And I'll try to go through this as quickly as possible. I do wanna thank the panelists from earlier uh, for their inspirational uh, insights, uh, both the young folks and our fellow council members. I thought it was awesome. And I want to thank for the work of the col uh, collaboration group. Uh, I was involved in that early on, and you guys really took it to a, to a new level. Um, and uh, the Scott is a part of the youth engagement group, but we really thought that the college and post-secondary education and credentialing institution uh, needed a call out. Uh, he's led that charge. And really, I want to lay this out in the context of obstacles, uh, opportunities, solutions and recommendations uh, and they'll fall in line with much of what we've discussed so far. So if you think about it, higher education is a diverse sector and it makes it difficult for it to focus sectors attention on a specific issue such as disconnected youth. Currently the higher education sector, especially public institutions, are financially stressed because of the significant reductions in state funding. And increased resource scarcity is making it difficult for colleges and universities to undertake new initiatives outside of the core, their core areas of teaching and research. And as we've heard a lot of today, too many students are graduating unprepared for college or the workplace. And this reality is really leaving us with undesirable success rates in terms of retention in schools or credentialing institutions uh, or completion rates. And then affordability, which we've also heard a lot about, and it continues to be a significant obstacle, uh, not enabling kids to com complete their education and graduate. But where there are obstacles, there are opportunities. And increasingly, colleges, many of whom are anchor institutions, employers, uh, but anchor institutions and in parts of the community uh, are getting more involved in those community activities and interested in the topic of youth development and education. And so we think there's a clear opportunity to capitalize on this movement in the spirit of engagement prevalent among colleges and more importantly their students. By virtue of, of, of all that's going on right now, community colleges and public, uh, public institutions are really a highlight of you know, this administration's focus and we think can be a big part of success for disconnected youth. The federal government's support of community colleges and public institutions has the potential to create many, many more opportunities for youth. 
And I was recently at the Association of uh, Community College Trustees meeting, uh, and their focus is really on student success and completion rates. Youth, regardless of their socioeconomic situation, are technologically connected. I think Bridges survey said 40-some, 6 percent, you know, use technology to gain access. Colleges and universities can leverage social media and online learning to help youth develop the skills to be successful in an academic environment and to be prepared. So when we think about the steps towards solutions, we're thinking through Scott's leadership and Scott's efforts, encouraging a systemic linkage between education and credentialing programs and workforce needs. Uh, a common theme, and we'll hear more of it, I'm sure, in the next discussion, but from an employer's perspective, uh, how do we make those connections? Next, identify the businesses and their needs in terms of skills development and market valued credentials and provide earn and learn opportunities. Describe how the education sector can collaborate with other entities so, so that we can meet the diverse needs of youth through cross-sector collaboration and promote large-scale reform that provides youth with access to education and credentialing pathways so that they can get GEDs, diplomas, one, two, and four-year degrees that are accessible, that are relevant, relevant, and that are impactful. Impactful for those students, for, those, for the youth, and ultimately impactful for the community and that community's economy. Our recommendations really go around identifying uh, solutions that are scalable and replicable and relevant for education and credentialing programs that connect youth to jobs and degrees. And we need to move from a focus on college access to college completion. So, so the real recommendations really are that we leverage the corporation for community national volunteerism and community solutions, mobilize those universities, leaders of colleges and universities and other credentialing organizations um, to join together to champion the issue of disconnected youth and to work among themselves and with others in the communities to move the needle on this issue. And then finally, that as part of our continued efforts to identify success stories across all sectors, that the council also recognize and emphasize education and credentialing institutions who work with community organizations working to expose youth to career opportunities, to provide youth with on-the-job experience, provide credentials, degrees that lead to employment, and use these examples to catalyze others to create more initiatives that breed more success. So uh, with that, there are a lot of programs we could highlight, whether that is the um, Posse Foundation, Imagination America Foundation, Bonar Scholarships. Uh, I know uh, from my experience that uh, 21st Century Skills uh, for America program fosters an environment, uh, and I've paid more attention since being on this council to how communities come together. I was recently in uh, Winston-Salem, uh, North Carolina, uh, and I was always impressed with the goodwill there in terms of their levels of collaboration with United Way, with the Credit Council, with the Community College Network. But what st struck me when I was there two weeks ago is that in Forsyth County, they have a uh, program uh, that we, we haven't highlighted on the council yet, but it's called Foresight Futures. And it's all about community collaborations, using technology so that, uh, so that community players know what they're, each other are doing so that they can come together, eliminate redundancies, and solve problems together. So, you know, is it, is it the organizations that collaborate that lead to the community to collaborate, or is it the community that leads to the organizations, you know, 
I don't know, but it is, like everything else, a pretty interesting cycle. Uh, and I think there in Winston-Salem where it comes together with the community college uh, sector, it's a pretty powerful thing. So that concludes my report on behalf of Scott. Very good, Jim. Um, we, we have a lot uh, to learn here about how the education sector, individual leaders, collective leadership um, can and should extend themselves uh, for this particular challenge. If there are issues you want to lay on the table, and we won't have time to discuss them in the next uh, few minutes, um, uh, Scott is represented here by Heidi Winston, where is she, Heidi, who's helped uh, bring us this far with this important topic. We're going to be deepening and coming back to lots of you uh, to deepen this effort around education that matters. Uh, but I know we have some people here that know far more than I do about how education matters at that level. Uh, Jim, Judith, anybody here that wants to put something on the table for future consideration? Sure. I, just one comment, and I want to take us back to February when we had our first meeting and we met with the folks who had done the Pathways to Prosperity report. And you might remember that a key part of that was really trying to change, reframe the dialogue about uh, secondary education being about college or career and really thinking about a both and approach and there's something in this presentation that speaks to that as well that it's not just about access it's also about completion so the point that I'd want to make is that as we think about how to build this work out I would hope that the focus isn't going to be solely on higher education because I think there are exemplars around the country of things happening in the secondary education <coughs> approach in terms of rethinking how secondary education is delivered to access the population that we care most deeply about. And I worry that if we focus solely on higher education, we miss a key access point to get to the youth that we're trying to target. So I just want to make sure that that Very point good. isn't lost. Good. Uh, lots of nods around the table. So that will, will, will be a critical part. Any others who want to put something on the table? Judith? Um, Jim's really excellent summary on the last uh, page uh, Jim didn't mention because he was uh, just highlighting examples, but Campus Compact is an existing organization of presidents who are committed to their communities. They are, have not thought about themselves in this way, and it would be really interesting early to find out whether there's a nexus with that already organized group because we're looking at community-based solutions in other parts of the work we do, and they may be a key touchstone to integrate across some of our working groups. That's very helpful. And that goes back to Jim's final uh, one. Arthur, could you go back to here very briefly to Jim's recommendations that the Corporation for National and Community Service engage a back one more. Uh, the, the most civically minded college and university presidents and campus compact is actually the definition in some levels of that uh, and the rest of higher education and with, with Jim's addition and others who are considering educational and credentialing at, in the secondary system to join together to champion the issue of disconnected youth. And I think that's an important role that we, we seek for you to facilitate, but you see a lot of energy around this table. Uh, to, to participate and uh, ensure that education and credentialing institutions and community organizations really are addressing the needs of this group of youth uh, in their education and employment programs. Um, we heard you say yourself that you were committing to extending one of your service programs from 30 percent disconnected youth to 50, 50 percent disconnected youth and that kind of conscious choice on these programs is essential. Because it has yeah. ramifications to the program, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. I think in terms of NCCC, you know, the goal is actually 50 percent opportunity youth, uh, just as an example. And we had yesterday, uh, our team had some fantastic conversations with Scott with regards to how Good. we could move forward this particular uh, initiative. Good. Super. Thank you. Um, now we, it is, we are 12.02 by the clocks scattered all around this 12.04, and some of the clocks scattered all around this room. Uh, <laughs> Uh, which leaves us with 28 minutes in our uh, public session. We have one topic still to go, a big one where there's been lots of positive work about how, uh, about, about what we need to do uh, to achieve employer engagement. Uh, we were going to spend 20 minutes at the end on wrap up. I will move that down to three if you can bring it home at, at 1227. Uh, because I think, <laughs> I, I think people are here for the meet and uh, um, there will be lots of ways we follow up in the future. So um, uh, Byron and Bobby, uh, employer engagement. 
Great, thank you. Um, well, we've heard a lot, uh, actually, in the earlier presentations about um, uh, employers, either explicitly or implicitly, and their importance um, in this equation um, to help uh, realize the, the opportunity and the, and the potential of the young people we're talking about. We saw, particularly I'm thinking of uh, the survey, and we saw that uh, such a critical priority for the young people surveyed uh, was to have a job opportunity that's consistent with their educational goals and consistent with their life circumstances and their life responsibilities. Um, and we also saw among those that they would like to see more of are business mentors. And I think that those, are, those findings were very consistent um, with what we found in the best practices. So um, our, hmm, let's see, are you driving this? Okay, one more. So what we, so our purpose then in this youth um, uh, employer partnerships work um, is to figure out, help to figure out uh, and to get to employers uh, the why, the what, and the how uh, to create clear and community supported and mutually beneficial pathways to employment for young people currently, uh, not currently in work uh, or school. So by the why, we mean the motivation and the business case um, for employers. Um, uh, for the what, it's the information uh, and really the best practices um, uh, and, and examples. Uh, and then uh, on the how, it's the tools, and an actual toolkit to, uh, because of course employers have uh, businesses to run. Uh, this is not the main thing they do. So we've got to make it easy, relatively easy for them to uh, engage in, in really productive and high impact ways that, that motivate um, uh, the, the all their uh, employees and that, that really uh, get the benefits. Um, and so I think, you know, as this council works and others work to really uh, elevate um, this issue, we're going to see um, employers asking themselves more and more what role can, can they play. And so we want to be ready uh, with a set of tools, uh, a set of examples. I mean, actually, even um, in a way, uh, many of these employers need mentors themselves. They need to know um, what other employers have gone before them and, and really made this work uh, to give them the, the, the courage uh, to believe that, that this is going to this is going to work for them too. So that's a lot of what we're about. Um, so in, in the our brief presentation uh, right now, uh, I'm going to touch on the business case for employers um, as well as talk a little bit about uh, where we think there are the greatest opportunities um, uh, by sector. We've talked also here about the need to uh, to focus on the biggest opportunities. We've tried to highlight that. Um, and then uh, uh, Bobby, uh, uh, who has just done a fabulous job uh, co-leading this group, is going to talk about some terrific work on uh, case studies and then the toolkit, which I think um, is pretty exciting work and, and that has a lot of potential ultimately to, uh, to be a tool of outreach uh, to, to employers. So um, first, just to, um, just to remind us, as we think about uh, the potential of the young people we're talking about, um, what are the barriers to realizing that full potential? And this is something we talked about in our last uh, meeting. So I just want to remind you, um, as we look at the, 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 the population of these young people, um, we see uh, two kinds of barriers. One is a barrier uh, of uh, preparation. Uh, educational preparation, in particular education and skills, um, and then another barrier on the, the, in a sense, the ability to take up those opportunities given um, the various uh, life constraints and challenges um, that people are facing at any given moment in time. Um, and, and the reason this, this segmentation um, matters from an employer standpoint is as you think about this upper right-hand corner, folks that, that really are, are actually reasonably well prepared, um, typically with um, high school degrees, and are actually um, uh, uh, reasonably uh, well situated in life to be able to take up employment opportunities. That's a place where uh, employers, if they have the right tools, they can actually lead. Employers can lead and they can actually address the segment um, pretty directly. Um, whereas uh, if you get more to the lower left um, with folks who um, are facing a greater life challenges who are maybe less well prepared. That's where employers really need to be part of these community collaboratives you're talking about because that we've been talking about because there are a much greater set of needs. Employers absolutely can play a role here, um, but they need a lot more partnership. Um, and we think over time they need a lot more experience. So 
um, our, our thinking has been uh, for employers that, in a sense, when you get employers that are new to this, um, you actually kind of want to get them started um, in the, the easier to start segment. Um, and as they get more experience, they can be more productive participants in these broader collaboratives. At least that's our hypothesis and the way we think we'll be able to move forward. So briefly on the, the business case, again, um, as we've mentioned, as we, many people have mentioned, um, this group of, of, of uh, Americans is not really um, uh, much focused on um, by business or by that many other folks. So it's, um, it's, uh, it's a challenge uh, to, to get the business case uh, in, in front of uh, businesses. But actually, um, as, we, as we did our research, we concluded that um, a combination of um, more traditional business benefits of the sort that could be recognized by, uh, say, an HR department, and um, a broader set of, of, of benefits around uh, branding and community engagement and broadening the talent pool and um, uh, creating the, almost a license to, to operate uh, uh, effectively and with community support, um, add another layer of benefits. And, and it's actually the combination of those two um, that we think are going to, to, uh, to really get us up and running. So uh, we, we absolutely can make the, the business case um, to avoid the cost of inaction, the sense of uh, business um, uh, as citizens and understanding uh, uh, quantitatively the impact on uh, their communities and society. Um, we can talk about the, um, the reputational benefits, and I think the case studies here um, are uh, tremendously positive, and we're getting better and better um, at measuring uh, those benefits and businesses realizing uh, those benefits. Um, there's actually, uh, for those uh, uh, employers who've gone down this path, there are great um, morale benefits for uh, their uh, existing employees. Um, and retention benefits, uh, because remember, uh, as we as we've looked at these success cases, it's not just about bringing people, you know, bringing young people into work. It's absolutely about mentoring relationships. It's about forming relationships. We heard how important they are to the young people here, but the, the flip side of that is how important they are to the the mentors on the other side of those relationships, and how meaningful uh, that is. And employee retention. Uh, is, is a big deal. Um, also, uh, many of these businesses, as you look at the segments, um, a lot of their growth opportunity um, is into communities um, where a lot of these young people live. And it's, it's serving uh, as customers, um, uh, actually, these young people themselves, um, their families, their neighbors. And so uh, having um, uh, getting that talent pool that really connects to that community uh, is actually an advantage. So there are some very significant advantages, and we've we've gone um, uh, deeper than the summary level. Let me talk a bit about where we would focus um, our efforts. So we looked across um, the the whole U.S. economy and said, you know, really, where are the job uh, opportunities for young people? Um, and actually, it's fairly concentrated for um, a diverse uh, economy. If you, if you look at these in big sectors, um, the four uh, biggest sectors are probably where, are already where 72% of young people who are employed uh, have jobs. That's in leisure and hospitality, in wholesale and retail trade, in education and health services, um, and then in business services. Um, so, and as we look at the, the growth potential um, based on some uh, McKinsey Global Institute scenarios, um, those could create another two million uh, jobs for, for young people uh, in this decade. Um, uh, and, and also, uh, there are very real uh, talent gaps, and talent gaps not just at the level of PhDs and statistics and the like, but, but absolutely in uh, vocational trades, um, in, um, in ad administrative trades, things where, I mean, to Jim's earlier point, um, if we get young people um, understanding what those opportunities are early on, and, and, and one of the best ways to do that is actually to connect them uh, to employers. So I think employers play absolutely a role uh, upstream there, too. Um, I wanna, wanna just touch briefly on healthcare, just to give you um, uh, an example. Uh, uh, we think the healthcare industry is a very important um, industry to focus on, and we'll be talking uh, more about that in some of our, our work group sessions. Um, uh, we think uh, over a 10-year period, um, healthcare is going to produce about 20% of all the new jobs um, in the country, um, and uh, that that 
60% of those jobs uh, require less than a four-year degree. So they're relatively accessible jobs, and at the same time, um, they are jobs that, that really do represent uh, the first step on a, on a career ladder. Um, there is an ability uh, to um, uh, move up the ladder and, and build new skills. By the way, there's also a flexibility uh, across geographies because um, the healthcare industry is not a concentrated industry. It's, it's everywhere uh, in the country. It's in, it's in big cities, obviously. It's in rural areas, uh, suburbs, exurbs. So there, there's a, there are tremendous uh, opportunities there. And, and typically, um, employers in the sector uh, have um, supported uh, continuing education. So um, that, that, that is a great opportunity. By the way, I will mention that uh, we, we could have profiled many other sectors and um, education, and we talked about the role of educational institutions as anchor institutions in many places. Um, I, I think we shouldn't lose that. They're obviously very important from a credentialing and skills development standpoint, but they are also important employers. So we're not only talking about for-profit employers here. We Obviously, for-profit employers are an important part of this picture, but actually, if you look at where those jobs are, quite a substantial number are in uh, sectors or institutions that are defined as nonprofit, whether that's in healthcare or education or social services and the like. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Bobby Silton to talk about our, our case studies and our, the, the employer toolkit. Thanks, Byron. And so Byron covered the, the why, like why should we be doing this as, uh, in the employment sector, and then also some of the what, what sectors matter here. And in order to spark employers to action uh, so they can create more opportunity for youth, we actually need to give them the how. And so that's what we're going to talk about now is how are we going to do this. So uh, the recommendations that we're making here are based on insights from the listening sessions. We also did a case study um, overview of about 15 different companies, which I'll highlight a little bit what some of those insights were. And then I think the panel this morning and then the work that Bridge presented just really reinforced some of the things that uh, we, we are building this toolkit around. Um, some of the things, just key takeaways from the listening session highlights that we threaded through. We wanted to make sure that we weren't just listening but actually doing something with what we heard. So we threaded through the caring adult theme that we've again heard again and again this morning. Flexibility, making sure that employment doesn't get in the way of, of more education if a young person wants to get more education. Wraparound services, we heard about um, some additional barriers that might get in the way. Of, uh, of gainful employment, and then making sure that when we provide learning for young people that it's relevant. So um, the case studies I'll provide uh, some insight to, but first what I want to do is walk through the three ways, three different models we think that employers can engage with young people. And um, we looked at a lot of different, I think we came up with like 15 different ways employers could engage, but that's not a very easy how. So we said, let's just bucket them into three buckets that we think um, have increasing degrees of commitment and difficulty. And so we want to make sure that uh, one, as Byron said, for employers that don't have a lot of experience in working with disconnected youth, that we make it a little easier for them to start and then they have success and then can move up the ladder or they might want to go deeper in the program that they're pursuing. So let me talk about these three and then give you a few examples to bring it to life. So the first one is life skills development. So this is companies engaging with young people to provide work relevant soft skills and this could include things like communication skills, time management, decision making. Um, it could also include other soft skills, but we felt in, in approaching employers that we should focus on first work relevant soft skills. So examples of how a company might be able to do this is provide life skills workshops or have employees be mentors. And a great example of this is there's a private company called Southwire. They're a cable and wire manufacturer. And they work with the Carroll County Schools. And they have their employees, whether they're an engineer or a vice president, who are volunteering to be uh, mentors for young people. So we heard about caring adults. These are people in um, the work world who are providing mentorship. And they might provide a certain perspective for this young person in their life. So that's a way uh, companies can engage on the life skills front. The second way is relevant learning opportunities. So these are opportunities that give young people insight into the world of work. Because 
a lot of these kids don't come from communities where they're getting that opportunity to see what is it like to go to work in an office or in a business. And um, this is an opportunity for them to get that uh, exposure to work. And it could come through things like a job shadow day where they could go to a company and see what it's like to work there, <coughs> um, career exploration guidance. So uh, a lot of these young people aren't getting, they probably don't know that any of our jobs exist in some of these communities. And so we saw on one of the slides earlier today some of the choices, you know, doctor, lawyer, veterinarian. I think those were the choices I had when I was a kid. I didn't realize a foundation job existed when I was a kid. So, um, uh, it's hard to believe. Yeah, it's hard to believe, but I'm glad, I'm glad I found it. I'm glad I found it. And I, I can say that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, a great example of this, of a company engaging on this front, is Google. And they work with citizen schools. And they actually run these apprenticeship courses where over the last uh, several years, I think they started this in 2006, they've had 250 volunteers run about 100 of these apprenticeship courses where they're giving young people exposure to careers that leverage science and math. So really important in the STEM, STEM area, encouraging students to have interest in that area. And then the last one is the Learn and Earn program. So we've heard this referenced a lot this morning. This enables young people to develop job skills in a learning environment. And they're also getting compensated for their performance. Uh, but it's done in a way where it's a little safer than maybe going in and, uh, and just getting a, 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 a permanent position. And examples of this uh, are paid internships and then also permanent positions where they build this learning environment into that. Um, an example of this is CVS is partnering with WorkSource Partners. Uh, this is part of a, a program that's funded in part by the Kellogg Foundation's The New Options Project. And they provide not only internships, but also career mentoring and education completion encouragement. I think we also all heard uh, a great talk from a Year Up leader in our first uh, meeting. They're another organization that does a lot of partnership with companies and really helps them navigate through this whole world of, of um, employing underserved youth. And they also prepare them to be successful in those roles. So those are the three examples. And the next slide just gives a little bit of a, a deep dive into if a company is doing a learn and earn program, what are some of the best practices? And this came from the 15 case studies, and we were fortunate enough to have an MBA intern team that dove into this. And what was so fabulous was at the end of the summer, they said working on this project was the highlight of their summer. So it was very, very cool. They did it as a 10% project. And they came away with four big buckets of takeaways here. First of all, most companies, when they employ disconnected youth, are looking at clear selection criteria. It could be that they have a GED or they're low income. Some look for just youth that are unemployed, but they set some criteria for how to select young people. They're also looking for some motivation, like someone has to want to be there. It doesn't mean they have to be a you know 3.0 student to demonstrate motivation. It's just that they have to want the job. The second, I talked about a little bit earlier about flexible support for education, so work hours, making sure that work hours are accommodating education hours so that they don't block more education. And uh, research would say that about 12 to 15 hours a week if a young person is in school, that that's about what they can work. Because once you get beyond 15 hours, you really start to, to affect how effective they could be um, in the school, school world. Um, I'm going to go on to the next bucket, on-the-job learning. So that's what these apprenticeships and internships are for. But what is great is that if these apprenticeships and internships lead to job placement after that internship is done, and then having mentoring support. And this is a way to engage employee volunteers. So again, you know, the Google example of, of, um, of let's engage uh, uh, volunteers, connect them to these young people and then also provide them with soft skills, things like teamwork and attire, like how to, how to dress for work. And then lastly, just to highlight a few of these practices, so these are additional practices, set high expectations. 
So one of the things um, that uh, these companies do is that they expect something from these young people, but they help them achieve those expectations. And I think this ties directly back to the work Bridge presented this morning about these young people want to be responsible for their future. And so I think that companies need to, um, to have them be responsible and have expectations. Uh, they also provide wraparound support that I talked about earlier, and then also fostering open communications. Uh, companies that do this work, they don't have it all right, so they're going to ask for feedback, the ones that do it well, and they're going to ask for feedback not only from the young people, but from the nonprofit partners that they work with. So with that, let me just quickly highlight, because I'm watching the clock, because I know Patty said we had to be done. Well, by we, <laughs> we, 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 we've checked. We've We've checked with the powers that be, and the clock can be extended for okay. five minutes okay. past 11.30. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm still going to have try to We're have an on-time sure arrival. Make sure our audience knows we'll go five over. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, this is important. I'm going to highlight um, at a very, very high level uh, the toolkit and the four steps of this toolkit. We really did try to be practical. I think we're gonna learn a lot when we get more feedback, but that's the hat that we had on of how do we make this practical, um, simple enough, but not simplistic. It needs to be thoughtful uh, to do this work well. So there's four primary components. The first one is really important. It's a self-assessment. So we want companies, before they just dive in with good intentions to really assess what's my readiness as a company and what are my resources. So uh, what are we willing to commit to actually do this work? Once they take the self-assessment, it doesn't take that long, but they score themselves on a variety of, of, uh, of questions. And we actually asked companies that do this work well, what are some of the questions they ask themselves? So we tried to have it be um, uh, user-based of people who've gone through this process. And then at the end of the assessment, a company will either score that they're best suited for life skills work, um, they might be better suited for relevant uh, learning, or they might be ready to do a learn and earn program. It's not a prescription. It's not because you scored this, you have to do this. But it's really more about we would suggest that you start here, um, but it's not a rigid tool by any means. Once a company picks one of those three lanes, then they go through the next three steps. Um, step two is defining the scope of the program. So now let's get specifics. What scale do you want this to have? What resources are gonna go against it? And to, we give them a worksheet to do this. So we, we don't just wanna give them ideas, but we actually ask them questions like, are you going to leverage employee as volunteers and how many do you think you could get to do this? And so we ask them to be very specific, and as they answer the questions, they're basically starting to build their plan. We then go to step three, which gets more specific. Who is your nonprofit partner? Who are your partners internally? Because a lot of times this work takes HR partners in, in particular. Who from the HR department are you talking to? And um, maybe you ought to be bringing those people in to help you build this plan. Then we give them a quick step pilot. So essentially, uh, we give them a, not a, quite a recipe, but a su serving suggestion of here's what you might be able to do with a job shadow day. Here is actually how you can run a job shadow day. And then once they execute the pilot, we ask them to reflect on, well, did you hit your goals? You set up some goals. We encourage measurement that that's important. Sometimes the measurement at the beginning may be very output-based, how many kids showed up, how many volunteers that you have. But over time, we hope that measurement gets more sophisticated. And then finally, to have them refine and grow the program. And growth here doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna serve hundreds of young people. It might be we're still gonna serve 20 young people, but we're gonna go deeper. We're gonna provide more wraparound services, or we're gonna provide more mentoring, or it could be we're gonna take it to other markets. But this is the step, um, the steps that uh, organizations, companies will go through, and we hope this toolkit will help make the thought of engaging with disconnected youth a little less daunting. And um, we hope at some point that perhaps there's a community, as Byron said, you know, companies need mentors too. And I know I spend time talking to other companies that want to do this kind of work. And we just share ideas of, of uh, how to do this more smartly. So lastly, just to kind of round us up and 
the last slide here. Um, we're going to uh, develop an outreach uh, support plan to help inform all of you so that you can, can talk to other employers about the value of these types of programs and of using the toolkit. We're also going to spend some time refining this toolkit over the next few months. Um, we're also going to highlight and promote the tools as a resource available um, to employers and make sure that they understand that uh, um, uh, there is a way, a mutually beneficial way to connect with disconnected youth. And lastly, we're going to recommend that the Corporation for National and Community Service work with agencies within the administration to promote this tool kit in conjunction with youth employment programs that are currently underway and also to post this on a website for open source use. We, we think that everyone should be able to access this. They should be able to modify it as, as they see fit and really make it work for their organization. So with that, um, I'm going to open it up for questions for me, Byron, and any of the uh, YUP2 team. Please, Bill. This is a very, very good presentation, and I think it's dead on the mark. Uh, we've been in, we're building centers in five U.S. cities. Every one of them has a health care program assigned to it. Not three, five, 100 percent. So I think that this, this is reality. The second thing we found is that hospitals are willing to invest money, their money, in these programs. We've gotten on an average between $500,000 and a million dollars per city invested in the training program. So they're willing to put some money into this thing. Thirdly, almost an unintended outcome, they're not totally satisfied with the quality of their workforce. The quality of the people they're getting are not that well trained. Now they won't say it publicly, but they will tell you privately, which in my mind creates an opportunity. Because if we can really create programs that get these young people competently trained and the hospitals will work with you in partnership to customize a curriculum for their needs, it's a home run. And so we can leapfrog one of the steps in the process by allowing the hospitals and the young people to actually get engaged with a partnership strategy specific to those employment needs with a defined outcome. So I think this is right dead center on what, what this conversation is all about. I can e echo it in my own experience. Great. I'm going to get a series of, of comments and then let the two of you kind of come back. Jonathan? I would just, I also would concur with what Bill said. I think this is yeah. fascinating and pretty compelling, the numbers are, particularly when you map it to some of the stuff we talked about last night vis-a-vis -vis the cost of the disconnected youth. I think the thing that would be beneficial would be case studies. Yeah, exactly. To add to this, and you mentioned Google and what they're doing, but to enrich this with case studies by sector that create examples that we can look to to better understand where employers are actually making this work. Jonathan, that's a great point. And, and one of the organizations that have been helping us with this is Corporate Voices for Working Families. And they have a, uh, they have a lot of great case studies that they've been willing to share with us. And many of them are public on their site. But I think that's a great point. We, we can make those better known. Others ask a question? question? Please, Judith. Um, the taxonomy is fantastic. And ways. a question is, is, is there, and I don't know from the work done so far, um, a reason to differentiate small and medium-sized businesses from large employers as you're developing a toolkit, or do you think there's enough generalizability so that that's not? Yeah, I think that's a, a great question. And one of the reasons why we defined it as medium to large size, because we felt you needed to have resources, uh, HR resources, certain, certain people you could tap into. It doesn't mean that the principles can't be applied by any business. And I think that's the lens that we need to look at this as we go into the next phase. Um, but the, the initial start, we had the thinking that, OK, let's if we could only get so many companies to sign up, then let's go to the ones that could employ a great number of young people. Um, the, the reason, and, and we can explore this further, but um, we at Rockefeller have been looking at the TANF program's um, funding in the stimulus bill, which was directed 
solely to small business, but it was uh, underemployed or relatively unemployable, um, so there could be generalizability. And, and as we know, 48 states used it. So we're in the process of funding and analysis of that data set to see what are the unique opportunities or um, constraints that small businesses have in taking in. And since we all know the numbers about the size of small business into the economy, maybe just as a separate piece of this, yeah. because the economic impact of job creation in that sector has been judged to be quite significant, um, we could think about a kind of another work stream. We should have many of those data and time for. It, it, it's a great point, and I think the key is going to be figuring out the, the distribution channel, because I, I do think that the, the tool, because it's self-assessment and so forth, can be valuable for small business, but it's more a question of how do we you know, get it out there in a, in a cost-effective way. And, and who provides that additional support, and that may be where one of these collaboratives does come into play, the things that you can turn to in a in a gap for support don't exist in the small business. Very interesting. Um, Very Patty, interesting. I I just want to add one thing. I actually think that to Bill's point, just to echo it from, from my perspective as an employer, I think you could actually go back to slide five where you have what's in it for employers and consider adding funding streams and access to creative financing based on hiring strategies, not just um, streams. One stream is, is funding associated with individual employees that you're hiring from job training programs, and we have case studies around that, that's common, but then also access to bigger creative financing streams around capital expansion, et cetera, um, when you develop hiring practices in line with this philosophy. And so it's, they're real dollars in addition associated with this that, that folks should be really aware of on the employer side. There is, a, I think, a, a recently created $5 billion program out of the SBA for impact grants related to these type of folks. Very good, very good. Well, there will be much more as we work to deepen this. This has uh, um, been a fabulous discussion. And as I said when we started, the, my feeling in reading ahead on this meeting was that if um, 10 months ago the President created the executive order to create this council and we spent the first some months just understanding the landscape, who, what were the issues, what were the opportunities, and then we came together in June to say, here are some things we believe that with our assets we should go deeper on and consider. And then we came today and um, spoke to what can the social sector do? Uh, what can the employer engagement do for us? What and how do we recognize that youth aren't the leaders of the future, they are the leaders in this solution? And, um, and um, the wonderful work by, by Bridge through third party action to actually understand what is it that the public needs to know uh, about these youth and how can we raise their voices? It uh, was a, a great summary of uh, what we've learned about how we need to proceed. Now we will move to the coming months of working out much more specifically the depth and the the magnitude of how we can get these things, these, these, this awareness, these tools, um, this commitment that we have in this room uh, to, to go much further and uh, have the impact that we're all looking for, whether that's through partnerships with the corporation, with, partner, uh, with uh, um, inspired third parties that choose to act, with um, uh, our partnership with the, with the White House, with the work that you all represent here. Um, tremendous amount of knowledge, tremendous amount of insight, and now we have to, as you all said at the beginning of this meeting, uh, see that the rubber meets the road and that we drive it through to change in communities and change in opportunity for these youth. So thank you very much and thank you to the public who's, who's joined us now or, or in future as you look through this uh, web stream. And um, we will now convene for a brief lunch. Thank you. Okay, and with that, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>